Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dabbler's Den. This is Chris Cottrell. <laughs> and as you can tell from this video's title, <laughs> I've gone and done it now. Uh, you know, I thought long and hard about making this video. And uh, as of right now, I haven't really decided if I'm going to make it an official part of my presentation on the formation of the Carolina Bays or not. And, you know, feel free to click on the link above if you want to check those out from the beginning. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'll let you guys decide, you know, after watching this video, you know, leave me a short message telling me whether or not you think I should make this part eight of my series or leave it as a standalone video, you know, kind of as an addendum, if you will. Uh, now, one of the reasons why I thought so hard about this is for many viewers, the very word Atlantis alone automatically shelves the presenter into the fringe dash wacko science category. And while, you know, I really don't have anything to lose, um, I do want to be taken seriously in, in the field. You know, and everything I'm about to share with you is backed by sound, historical, and geological information. Um, you know, and the other reason is because the lost city of Atlantis and the formation of the Carolina Bays were likely results of two separate global events. Uh, related, yes, but, uh, well, well, let me get into it and I'll show you what I mean. So what do we know about the lost continent of Atlantis? You know, let me, let me start by saying that I don't believe in magical crystals or undersea alien bases or any of that kind of stuff. You know, literally everything we know about Atlantis came from one man's mouth, the Greek philosopher Plato. Uh, some 2,400 years ago, uh, he recorded a conversation that Socrates had with a couple of guys some 200 plus years prior about another dude who talked with Egyptian priests about events that occurred 9,000 years before that. Uh, now, if, if you have ever played the classroom game where a secret gets passed from one ear to the next, you can understand where a lot of the skepticism comes from. Uh, you know the final message is never as it started. But with that said, I'm kind of amazed at the details Plato describes in his text. You know, he provides both when and how Atlantis was destroyed, uh, as well as important details about its size and shape. Um, as the story goes, uh, you know, told by the Egyptian priests, um, you know, 9,000 years before their time, uh, there was an ancient and epic battle where Egypt and Athens teamed up to defend against the more dominant and capable Atlanteans. Uh, they go on to say that the islands and mountains of Atlantis were located in front of the Pillars of Hercules, uh, which is now known as the uh, Strait of Gibraltar. Um, they go on to provide more details about, uh, you know, like the size, you know, Atlantis was, was larger than Libya and Asia. Uh, and they even provided exact measurements, uh, which require, you know, which, which equal right around 345 miles long and 230 miles wide. Um, and that's actually just a tad bit larger than the state of Georgia. Um, they, they mentioned mountains to the north of Atlantis and great fertile plains to the south, uh, as well as the main city of Atlantis to be composed of three alternating rings of land and protective moats. You know, that's, that's weird and oddly specific, but, you know, that's what they said. Uh, and finally, after the Atlanteans were defeated, the entire continent was swallowed up, people and all, uh, by the sea following violent earthquakes and floods. <laughs> you know, I'll admit that does sound a little fishy, and that pun is only slightly intended. Uh, but, you know, enough with the quackworthy historical interpretations. You know, let's go ahead and get down to the brass tacks and look at the geology of this event. You know, okay, let's start with the, uh, let's first look at the timing. You know, Plato wrote the dialogues of Timaeus and Critias uh, some 2,400 years ago, you know, about a Socratic forum uh, some 230 years prior to that, which discussed events that occurred 9,000 years before that. So, you know, 2,400 plus 230 plus 9,000, that equals 11,630 years ago, which surprisingly lines up perfectly with the end of the Younger Dryas. And we've talked about that time in detail in previous videos. Um, now, something that I haven't talked, talked about yet, and one way that I can tie this uh, to my Carolina Bay presentation is that the evidence of major meltwater events in our geologic past, you know, this, this graph up here, you know, this shows the meltwater pulses in relation to time. And this chart down here, um, this shows it even better. You know, you can see Mount Water Pulse 1A occurred right around that 12,900 year mark. 
exactly where I think the Carolina Bay forming comment, um, comet fragment impacted lower tide ice sheets, starting the Younger Dryas. And then sea level suddenly rose like 82 feet, <laughs> you know, and, and there's going to be more on this later, but um, it's, it's the Meltwater Pulse 1B that lines up almost perfectly with the disappearance of Atlantis as Plato describes it. You know, is it just a lucky guess? You know, I don't think so. You know, these Meltwater Pulses show that sea level has risen or, you know, sea level rise hasn't always been smooth and steady, you know, and again, rising at 92 feet, right, right at the end of the Younger Dryas. You know, by the way, it is very likely that the Earth is still crossing paths with a concentrated portion of the Torrid Meteor Stream. Uh, and it was, in fact, you know, another impact, this time into the ocean, that caused the rapid rise in temperatures that took us out of the Younger Dryas. Now, there's one super important detail that is being left out here, and that's the geologic concept known as isostasy. Okay, now water is incredibly heavy. You know, one gallon of fresh water weighs over eight pounds. Uh, you know, the entire country of Canada had up to two miles of frozen water on top of it in some places. You know, the, the Earth's crust isn't quite as rigid as we like to think, and it's basically floating on top of the asthenosphere. So if you take a tremendous amount of of a water weight out of the oceans and place that weight on top of the continent is going to push that land down. And you know, you can see that demonstrated in the, in the GIF here. Um, the isostatic equilibrium is altered as you know, you can see the crust is being pushed down and to adjust for that, you can see the land being pushed up on the outsides. Um, you know, during our ice ages, when the upper portions of, of North America were, are completely covered with uh, super heavy ice, you know, where do you think is the most likely location for that isostatic adjustment to take place? <laughs> well, you guys see where I'm going with this now. Um, you know, that's right. You know, we happen to have a divergent plate boundary, you know, not far away called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And, and the most likely location for the isostatic adjustment to push land up, uh, you know, while all that ice is pushing land down happens to be right where the North American, the Eurasian, and the African plates meet, right here. Um, and, and so, you know, if the continent of Atlantis did in fact exist, the only thing left are the peaks of its tallest mountains, you know, known today as the Azores Islands. Uh, my grandmother's side of the family was actually from the Azores, so it's always been a really special place for me. Um, and, and this entire area would have been lifted above the sea during our most recent ice age. Um, you know, as the temperatures warmed and the ice sheets began to melt and the isostatic equilibrium needed to be adjusted, uh, the entire area would have slowly sank. But when events like Meltwater Pulse 1A and Meltwater Pulse 1B happened, not only was there a tremendous amount of glacial water being added to the already rising sea, but you also had rapid adjustments due to the isostasy. Um, you know, this entire area would have likely have sank into the sea within a day or so, you know, just like Plato mentions. Uh, and, and it checks off all of Plato's other boxes as well. You know, it, it, it's directly in front of the Pillars of Hercules, um, not behind, not next to, but in front of. Uh, it fits the size requirements. You know, it, we find mountains to the north and vast plains to the south. And one more thing, if we focus on this area right down here, we notice some very unique oceanographic features known as sea mounts and gyos, you know, or commonly known as table mounts. Now, these table mounts, you know, now they're around eight to nine hundred feet below the surface of the waves. You know, they, you know, these could have been formed. Uh, they, they can only have been formed if they were exposed to the surface erosion for a really long amount of time. Uh, and if we start, you know, if, if I were to start my expedition uh, for the uh, capital, the lost capital city of Atlantis, I would begin my search right here in the center of cruiser table mounts. You know, I can almost make out the rings of land and moats mentioned by Plato. And, uh, you know, just so you know, I'm obviously not the only person to have thought this. Uh, this area over here, yeah, that's that's Plato Seamount. And this area up here, <laughs> yep, that's Atlantis Seamount. Okay, guys, I'm done. Uh, if you are or happen to know of an eccentric billionaire who wants to make a name for themselves, you know, by funding the actual discovery of the lost city of Atlantis, shoot me an email at dabblers.den at gmail.com. Uh, we'll get the ball rolling on that. But until then, uh, I'll get back to my Carolina Bay research and I'll catch up with you guys next time. Bye.